Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the inaugural uh, symposium of the Zuckerman Mind, Brain, and Behavior. I'm Rui Costa. I'm an investigator uh, at the Zuckerman, and I serve as the CEO. We have high hopes for this inaugural symposium, and we hope the symposium helps us acknowledge um, so many people that supported this endeavor and that paved the way for us to get here where we are today, and also help us to start to achieve our goals of doing transformative science to understand the brain by focusing on creating the right environment and by focusing on the scientists at every level, from student and postdoc to assistant professor to more established people. So doing science and transformative science by focusing on the scientist. Uh, I hope you can see that the program reflects a bit these goals. Uh, you know, we have a quiet room, a meditation room. There's going to be storytelling, uh, next year parkour, bungee jumping, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> anyway, to begin our symposium, I'd like to call to the podium Richard Axel, who's our, the co-director of the Institute, and he'll offer introductory remarks and also introduce our keynote speaker. Richard, please, welcome. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural symposium celebrating the Zuckerman Mind, Brain, and Behavior Institute. Our architect, Renzo Piano, has described these magnificent structures as factories for ideas. This beautiful illustration of man's early fascination with the brain, the Humani Corporis, was drawn by Vesalius in the 1500s. In this haunting but graceful image, the skeleton is contemplating a second skull. He is studying the brain. Indeed, one of the temptations of having a mind is to try and use it to solve the mystery of its own nature. Historically, scholars have assumed that the nature of thinking can be uncovered by thinking alone. This has been an assiduous pursuit of humans from the earliest moments in recorded history. The brain, however, is the most complex the most mysterious, and the most interesting structure in our universes. Perception, emotion, cognition, memory, action are represented by the activity of groups of connected nerve cells. How? The president of Columbia, Lee Bollinger, in a prescient moment, recognized that this astonishing problem in biology was at the core of virtually all intellectual endeavors at the university. Literature, history, art, law, economics, philosophy, and psychology embrace these problems. Lee conceived, with this recognition, Lee conceived of a mind-brain behavior institute that integrates the entire university to address this astonishing and profoundly important problem. The Mind-Brain Behavior Institute represents a new union and is the flagship structure of a new campus. Lee elicited the help of Tom Jessel, Eric Kandel, and myself. We were then joined by a brilliant and gracious philanthropist, Maud Zuckerman, who shared our deep interest in the mind. Tom 
Jessel was the creative force behind the Mind Brain Behavior Institute from its conception to reality. Tom was not only a great scientist, but also a brilliant leader. With a magical quality, he defined the cellular and molecular events involved in assembling a motor circuit, revealing how spinal cord neurons acquire specific identity and form selective connections that coordinate behavior. Through his creativity, he constructed biological edifices that have profoundly enhanced our world. This celebration is sadly tempered by his passing last week. His leadership and his creativity will be sorely missed. Let this symposium honor his memory by celebrating science. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker this afternoon, Catherine Dulac. Catherine is an unusual French neurobiologist. Catherine grew up in Montpellier, the daughter of two French intellectuals, professors in the humanities. She attended Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, performed elegant thesis research in neural development with Nicole Le Doirin, and came to my lab as a fellow over 25 years ago. Historically, French scientists have often elevated ideas above facts. <laughs> I expected a deeply intellectual, theoretical neuroscientist, perhaps a young French Larry Abbott. <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised. Catherine was an intense experimentalist who demonstrated the unique ability to identify important problems in neurobiology and used creative approaches to affect their solution. Catherine exhibits a deep and abiding passion for science, which she embraces avec élan, with a great spirit. Behavior is a consequence of experience. Experience acquired over long periods of evolutionary time can result in innate behaviors, whereas experience over the life of an organism results in learned behaviors. Catherine studies innate behaviors, behaviors elicited by collections of sensory neurons that recognize cues emitted by other individuals in a species. She's combined genetics, molecular biology, neural recordings, and behavior to provide a fundamental insight into the behavioral circuits that ensure appropriate responses to pheromonal cues. Importantly, through her science and her humanity, Catherine has demonstrated the admirable ability to subvert the limitations that society still imposes upon women. I look to you, Catherine, to help dissemble the remaining barriers to the success of women in science. It has been a great pleasure to watch your science unfold, and we look forward to your lecture molecular, cellular, and circuit level control of social behaviors. Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for 
the very kind introduction. Um, I'm very honored. I'm also extremely humbled to give the keynote lecture today, as I owe a great deal to you, as well as to uh, the, Columbia Neuroscientific Neuro the Columbia community of neuroscientists, with Tom, with Eric, to transform me from a developmental biologist of the quail and chicken embryo into an aspiring neuroscientist. And so uh, 25 years later, um, here I am, and I hope uh, you'll enjoy the journey that I would like to take you over, um, which is our journey to try to understand the control of social behaviors. Why social behaviors? Well, social cues are particularly significant for animals and for humans. Uh, significant for behavior, significant emotionally. Uh, for humans, uh, it's very clear that social interactions are central to the human experience. Uh, we spend a lot of our mental time to think about the people we like, the people we don't like. Uh, it's very clear that love, hate are some of the most central theme of human creation in art, in literature, in poetry. Um, and similarly, Humans love to be in this large assembly, uh, like today, or in concerts, or in church, in parties. And in the opposite, humans do very poorly when they are isolated. And in fact, one of the most debilitating aspects of mental illness is the inability to engage in fruitful social interaction, like in depression or autism or schizophrenia. So it's clear to say, it's clear that the human brain is geared towards social interactions. But similarly, uh, animals that are isolated don't do very well, and animals need to interact with others of their species to mate, to nurture their young, to defend their territory. And so over the years, we've been trying to use any type of technology of modern neuroscience from molecular, genetic, uh, circuit level approaches to try to have, to gain an understanding, a brain-wide understanding and a mechanistic understanding of the control of social behavior. So we are trying to identify the social cues um, that uh, animals need to identify in order to recognize other co-specific. We try to um, uh, identify the neurons uh, that detect these cues. Uh, we're trying to understand the process of social interaction. What is the processing uh, of social cues that lead to this interaction? And um, we try to identify the neurons that are involved in uh, this processing. Um, identify the properties of the network involved, and finally, how do they give rise to proper social behaviors and, and behavioral responses. And so uh, today I would like to um, uh, specifically emphasize one particular set of social behavior, the behaviors of adults with infants. And uh, there are a number of reasons for this. So parenting behavior is a particularly salient behavior, extremely important for both the emotional and the physical development of the offspring. In human, um, it involves years of care and sacrifice, but generally in animals, these are uh, often long-term uh, interaction between the parents and an infant. In human, there is this very uh, particular type of parenting that involves not only the parents, but the extended family, the friends, the social structure, what is called alloparenting. Now, parenting don't always go uh, very well, and um, a very uh, a clear uh, set of illnesses affect the quality of parenting, in particular in postpartum depression that affect around 20% of mothers and 10% of fathers, where symptoms are associated with extreme worry, dread, and feeling of failures that lead to a difficulty in bonding between the parents and the child, and sometimes are associated with thoughts, although no action of harming a baby. And here is the testimony of a patient with uh, postpartum depression. 
I have broken down I don't know how many times, or I'll get angry about the crime, then sad about being angry, and then guilty, like, why do I feel so sad when I have a beautiful baby? The emotions are insane. And this um, uh, excruciating feeling of a mother with postpartum depression are uh, quite typical of uh, people with this condition. What is unusual here is the person who emitted this, um, uh, this quote is uh, Serena Williams, someone who epitomizes women's trends. And so uh, this is really uh, something I think very striking. Now, parenting or interaction with infant can go extremely wrong uh, in the case, in rare cases of postpartum psychosis that affect very few mothers, but in which uh, the obsessive thoughts of harming a baby uh, would require hospitalization in order uh, for harm not to occur. Now, in animals, there is a large variety of infant-driven behaviors. Typically, uh, the mother is the primary caregiver of infant, and in mammals, this makes a lot of sense, since through um, pregnancy and then nursing, the mothers invest enormously in the offspring, and therefore uh, will make sure that this investment uh, comes to fruition and that the infant can grow and, and thrive. The uh, contribution of father is quite uh, different according to the species, and it varies from a very paternal species to species in, one, in which one sees neglect or even aggression. So this, for example, um, is a father titi monkey. Uh, with its uh, offspring. And in titi monkey, this is a very rare species uh, in which the father is actually the primary caregiver. So beside the specific period of um, nursing by the mother, then the father becomes the primary caregiver. And in contrast, um, this uh, longer here has just uh, killed a young infant. And uh, this behavior of infanticide that was actually described for the first time in uh, Langer by Sarah Hardy in the late 70s is thought to be an evolutionary driven behavior in order for male, foreign males in particular, to gain reproductive advantage by killing uh, the um, uh, offspring of their rivals and also uh, with females that no longer take care of their infant now uh, becoming sexually receptive again. Now, infant neg neglect and aggression can also be displaced by females, particularly uh, in case of stress, and uh, this is also uh, what I've just described to you about postpartum illnesses. So this fact really illustrates something quite interesting about the interaction between adult and infant, uh, which is the existence of these opposite responses to infant, pro-parenting or anti-parenting, according to the sex of the individual, according to its physiological state that provide a really interesting naturalistic paradigm to try to deconstruct the control of a particular set of social behaviors. So the first question we ask is how do um, animals detect infants? And so we're working with mice, and in mice there is a very clear sexual dimorphism um, in the reaction of males and females towards infants. Females, even virgin females that never had their own pub, are maternal, and they have communal nests and they take turn and uh, take care of their pubs. In contrast, virgin males are infanticidal, and when put in presence of pubs, they will, after a few minutes of examination, attack them and, and kill them. So the question we ask is, how, what are the pub cues that are detected <coughs> and that lead to these uh, distinct behaviors? For parenting, a lot of classical work, some of it uh, have been done actually here at Columbia uh, many years ago, have shown that uh, somatosensory cues, olfactory cues, and auditory cues are all important to drive parenting behavior, and that the removal of one or even two of these sensory modalities does not affect uh, parenting behavior, suggesting a redundancy of the cues uh, that make sure that these behavior are being displayed. In contrast, nothing is known about the cues that drive infanticidal behavior, and that made us uh, really curious to try to decipher the unique cues that drive this virgin male to attack infant. 
So this work was done by a former postdoc in my lab, Yu Isogai, who wondered what are the signals that virgin male utilize to then uh, recognize pup and attack them. And what he noticed is that uh, virgin male would attack a dead pup. Uh, suggesting that movement or temperature are not important for this recognition. And this drove him to um, make, uh, try to establish a reconstituted system in which he uh, designed silicon dummies. Um, the initial um, uh, making was the wrong color, but uh, this is a cask of, uh, silicon cask of, uh, of a pup. Um, and what he recognized was that male readily attack these pup dummies and in fact um, attack them uh, and make uh, bite marks that are absolutely similar to uh, what would be generated uh, by a, a, a die, dead or, or, or live uh, pup. So um, these uh, attacks also occur in full darkness, suggesting that vision is not necessary. And so that led him to try to identify the, what are the relevant morphological features of a pup. And so he designed this cask with uh, little variations. Um, I should also mention that this uh, dummy elicit attack when they are swabbed with pup pheromones, so extract of salivary glands. And so um, with a, a a uh, silicon dummy uh, swabbed with salivary extract. He saw attacks by the males. When he took a brick, an, um, an object of the same size, but of obviously very different size, there was no attack. Uh, when he reconstituted what he called a blob, which has uh, the shape of the, the, the head and the curvature of the body, um, swabbed with salivary extract, he saw no attack. And in contrast, this hybrid structure uh, that has legs and tails uh, does lead to attack, suggesting that a combination of pheromonal and physical cues uh, are necessary for um, this virgin male to identify pups and then attack them. So um, the, uh, this uh, led us in turn to try to identify more specifically the nature of uh, these chemical cues. And so the work from Richard and my lab and others um, identified many years ago uh, the receptors that are associated with the vormonasal system. So neurons in the vormonasal organ uh, detect pheromonal cues uh, with these two pheromone receptors, V1R, V2Rs. These neurons project to the accessory olfactory bulb and then to the medial amygdala, which is an essential processing center, and and then to areas of the hypothalamus involved in a number of social behaviors. And by contrast, the olfactory epithelium uh, using these OR families discovered by Richard and Linda Buck uh, lead to uh, the cognitive processing of odorants. And so we and others recognized uh, many years ago using a genetics ablation of each of these systems that uh, both the vorminasal organ and the olfactory epithelium need to work in concert to control mating behavior. So both are essential. And the particular role of the vorminasal system is to gate uh, the sex specificity of social behavior, which is that without a functional functional vormonasal system, female uh, mutants for the TRPSI2 ion channel display male-like behavior. And so this, in turn, led uh, Herbert Wu, now a postdoc in Richard's lab, to wonder whether the vormonasal system was also essential in gating the uh, infanticidal behavior uh, found in males. And indeed, uh, Herbert found that animals, males, without a functional vormonasal system are no longer infanticidal, suggesting that this sensory modality is indeed essential to drive infanticidal behavior, and instead uh, these mutants are fully parental. He also um, uh, confirmed an old observation that fathers are also no longer infanticidal and are parental. And this extremely interesting switch in behavior uh, is illustrated in the video here. This is a male that three weeks earlier was infanticidal, but after mating with a female and now put in the presence of pups that are not even his own pups, are now fully paternal. And you can see uh, the male dutifully retrieve uh, these five pups one by one. It has built a nest where it uh, retrieved the pups and then uh, does a good job making sure that no infant is left behind. <laughs> and then 
come back to the nest and will behave in ways that are completely indistinguishable from the behavior of a mother. So um, this switch in behavior was, is quite uh, extraordinary and suggests the existence of parental circuit in the male brain. So let, let's go back to these cues that are essential for infanticidal behavior. We saw that the vomonasal organ is essential to drive uh, infanticidal behavior. So we wonder what are the vomonasal receptors involved? And um, uh, Yo Isogai, a number of years ago, um, s developed a, a, um, an assay based on the uh, induction of the immediate early gene EGR1 uh, to identify the cues that are recognized by different vomonasal receptors. And he found that the majority of the vomonasal receptors respond to predator or heterospecific cues, and then a specific set of receptors uh, respond to female cues or male cues. So what are the receptors uh, responding to pub cues? And he was able to identify about seven vomonasal receptors. Um, that when the animal has been exposed to pub cues, it leads to uh, the specific activation of EGR1 that you see here in green, and then in red is the expression, uh, co-expression of specific vomonasal receptors. As a whole, the seven vomonasal receptors, or six that are presented here, represent over 92% of the response. So we think that we really capture the entire repertoire of vomonasal receptors responding to pub cues and responsible for infanticidal behavior. But to our surprise, none of these receptors are actually specific to pub cues, and we've had identified them all already as responding to adult female cues or male cues or both of them. So this really was intriguing and suggested an interesting possibility that actually the pubs do not emit their own cues. In fact, they might try to camouflage and mimic parental cues um, in order to escape males or perhaps predators. So this was, you know, an interesting idea of vomonasal stealth, if you wish, um, that we wanted to test further uh, by performing a, a genetic deletion of two of these receptors, the V2R65 and V2R88, that as a whole represent over 50% of the response to PUPS. And when we perform single mutant and double mutant, we um, uh, were able to show that indeed the double mutant no longer attack PUPS and uh, either retrieve the PUPS or ignore them, suggesting that although these receptors are in principle not specific to pups, they are actually uh, involved in the response, in the infanticidal response. So this was intriguing and uh, we were curious to know, well, what are the cues that are recognized by these two receptors? And so um, I was lucky uh, that Yo was a former trainee from uh, uh, Bob Tijan, so a very um, accomplished biochemist who um, found that it was a lot of fun to perform all sort of uh, biochemical chemical fractionation and ended up with purifying um, the submandibular gland uh, protein C, so a large salivary gland as one of the two pheromones, one of the two ligands of our, um, in our quest. And the second ligand, the second pheromone was really particularly astonishing because we found that it's uh, hemoglobin, so a component of blood. And in fact, the purified uh, fraction, as you can see, has this very clear red uh, taint. We were uh, very intrigued by uh, the presence of hemoglobin and wonder why would blood be present uh, in around the pub. As it turns out, uh, we were able to identify uh, blood from the mother uh, several weeks after parturition. So it turns out that um, uh, during uh, delivery, uh, this blood around from the placenta and, and from the mother, and this stays around and might be identified by, the, by males rolling around as a possible indication of the presence of pups. So uh, the submandibular gland also is also expressed by the mother, and uh, the infant is basically swabbed constantly by this protein, uh, by the leaking from the leaking of the mother. So overall, uh, this uh, uh, identified two new mammalian pheromones, this uh, submandibular gland protein and hemoglobin, and um, uh, shows also that somehow the pup identity is somehow revealed by cues deposited by the parents and particularly the mother.
So um, this uh, really gave us some, some pictures, some really interesting picture of, of the detection of uh, sensory cues leaving, leading to infanticide. And then we wondered about the processing of this signal. And so um, uh, we were uh, very fortunate to establish a collaboration with uh, Mark Schnitzer and Venki Murthy to perform mini and um, uh, microendoscopy uh, and use the miniscope uh, with a green lens reaching the medial amygdala. As you may recall, uh, the vomnasal organ sent input to the accessory olfactory bulb and the medial amygdala is the primary recipient of those input. So this is an area that we think is absolutely critical for the processing of, um, of vomnasal cues. Um, now, the problem with social interaction is that you cannot do experiments, uh, do recording on head fixed animal. The animal really need to be uh, moving around and and, and interacting with other conspecific. So uh, the availability of uh, this microendoscopy was really uh, uh, quite extraordinary for us. And um, indeed, uh, you can see here when the pup, pups have been put uh, in the cage that immediately uh, the um, neurons in the medial amygdala uh, start to fire. And um, uh, using a computational method that I won't have time to describe, we were able to show that the representation in the medial amygdala of the social information uh, is in part displayed by uh, individual population of neurons, but is significantly more robust and more reliable uh, at the population level. And this certainly was quite surprising for a modality that is thought to lead to instinctive behavior. But on the other hand, it also provides more flexibility for changes in this representation. And indeed, um, when we looked over time uh, at changes of this representation, animal uh, that are uh, left alone or put in presence of uh, an animal of the other sex and then put alone uh, again. So as you can see, this experiment lasts over three months and we record every five days from the same animal as the animal acquires sexual experience and then is put alone again. Uh, we were able to show here in this uh, 2D representation of, uh, of the neuronal ensemble that uh, at first the representation of male cues in blue, female cues in red, and um, pub cues uh, in green are uh, at least partially overlapping. But as the animal gain a sexual experience, now this representation um, uh, gets separated. And so the animal, in other words, is able to have way more discrimination of, uh, between these cues. And interestingly, uh, these changes are very long lasting, which is three weeks later or one month later when the animal is alone, um, uh, alone again, then this uh, uh, increased discrimination uh, is uh, continued. And as you can see, there's also a difference between uh, what's happening in males and in females, which is in male, as soon as the animal mate with a female, then the discrimination of pups, pup cues from the other type of cues uh, is elicited and then maintained. Whereas in female, um, this uh, increase in uh, discriminability between uh, um, female and pup cues and male actually is acquired later, uh, likely uh, when the, the female give birth. Another really interesting uh, characteristic of, of this is that we were able to block this plasticity in males, but not in females, by injecting uh, an oxytocin antagonist. And so uh, what we showed here is this long-lasting modulation of ensemble in the medial amygdala, um, and the pup representation in particular, um, due to sexual experience, and these mediated, at least in male, uh, by the neuropeptide oxytocin. So if we are back now to our cartoon, behavioral cartoon, uh, now we recognize that in addition to these infanticidal virgin males, now we have these paternal fathers, uh, these uh, males that have mated with females and three weeks later uh, are as parental as uh, the mothers and the virgin females. And so uh, these uh, lead us to this uh, really interesting uh, question of uh, the uh, control centers that drive these two behaviors of parenting behavior in fathers and female and infanticidal behavior in virgin males. So uh, the first 
uh, uh, central control that uh, we looked for and tried to identify are uh, neurons involved in the control of parenting behavior. And this, again, was um, initiated by uh, Herbert Hu when he was a graduate student in the lab. And he simply used um, the ability of neurons activated during parental behavior to elicit CFOS activation. And um, Herbert was able to identify this uh, particularly high induction of CFOS in the medial preoptic area of parental males and females compared to infanticidal males. Now, the uh, medial preoptic area does a lot of different behavior. It's involved in parenting, in sexual behavior, aggression, social interaction, thermoregulation, thirst, feeding, reproduction, sleep. All these nuances are intermingled. So it was particularly important to try to recognize the identity of the cells activated during parenting behavior. And uh, using a candidate search approach, Herbert was able to identify the neuropeptide galanin as marking about half, a little less than half of uh, the neuron activate during parenting. So about 40% of the cells activate during parenting are also galanin positive. And these neurons are also GABAergic, so they are uh, inhibitory GABAergic neurons. And in the next phase, uh, Herbert used um, classical optogenetic tools and genetic approaches to demonstrate the role of these neurons in parenting behavior. So first, using conditional diphtheriotoxin viruses, he was able to ablate uh, these galanin neurons and showed that um, uh, the, uh, the ablation of this population uh, now impaired the display of maternal and paternal behavior and also uh, switched uh, virgin females into becoming uh, infanticidal behavior. Um, the uh, opposite experiment to activate uh, galanin neurons in infanticidal males uh, led to the deduction, the, the conclusion that these neurons are also, um, uh, the activation of these neurons induces paternal behavior in infanticidal males. So these infanticidal males no longer attack pups and instead uh, groom them, suggesting um, that uh, these MPOA galanin neurons are an essential control node uh, for both male and female parenting. Now, interestingly, since then, uh, different groups, uh, Lauren O'Connell and Andy Bass, uh, find that uh, galanin expressing cells or even the expression of galanin is tightly associated with the display of parenting behavior in poison frogs. You can see this uh, paternal poison frog here with a tadpole here on the back, and also in this uh, spawning midge, uh, mid midshipman uh, fish, which is a paternal fish here uh, guarding his eggs. So uh, in the hypothalamus, uh, the function of neurons are known to be uh, usually very conserved, and it's therefore quite possible that these uh, galanin cells play a role in parenting behavior, uh, not only in mammals, but uh, even uh, further um, in, in other species. So next, we wondered how these galanin cells play their role in the control of parenting behavior. We talk about parenting as one thing, but in fact, uh, these neurons must receive a number of information about the internal state uh, of the animal, its hormonal state, its gender, also receive input um, about the presence of pup or other type of, um, of input. And in turn, they must control quite a number of behavioral components that overall constitute what we call parental behavior. So for example, the animal needs to build a nest, retrieve the pups, uh, groom them, nurture them, etc. And also, there are all sort of uh, hormonal and motivational aspects that change. Animals now are driven to interact with pups and uh, no longer interested in, in interacting with other animals. They have very specific hormonal level. Uh, the uh, saliency of sensory stimuli is uh, modified and they are no longer infanticidal. They have reduced stress level and they are no longer uh, interested interested in uh, other adult social interactions. So basically, you have a kid, you stay at home and watch TV, and you no longer go to the pub. So this is, uh, uh, forget about it. So how are all these different components controlled by this one population of galanin neurons? And so uh, Joe Nicole, former postdoc in the lab, decided to dissect entirely uh, the different components of the projection and input of these galanin cells. And um, what he found was way more complex than anticipated. He uh, found around uh, 20 different input areas to the galanin neurons 
and he could hypothesize that some of them, for example, the VTA or um, the nuclear sarcomans could be uh, involved in motivation, uh, the medial amygdala probably in this vormonasal input, uh, the VMH maybe in the control of aggression. So we could you know, hypothesize a, a number of uh, uh, possible functions. One interesting input area is the paraventricular nucleus. This is the area that contains oxytocin, vasopressin, CRH, and to our surprise, we actually found that uh, using rabies tracing from the galanin cells and then identifying the input neurons, specifically using antibody staining, we found that the majority of the cells in the uh, PVN are not expressing oxytocin but uh, uh, AVP. And so this is a bit uh, unexpected as you know, oxytocin is always presented as the hormone of uh, uh, parenting. So what about uh, the projection? Well, the projection were uh, also very interesting. To some extent, most of them were also identified uh, in our search for input, suggesting uh, the existence of um, recurrent loops of uh, regulation between uh, these different areas. Here again, there are areas that we can suspect to be involved in the motivational aspect of parenting, such as the nucleus accumbens or the VTA, uh, the motor control, such as the periodical gray, uh, social behavior such as the medial amygdala or hormonal modulation such as the PVN. But one essential question is to try to understand the logic of this projection. And using a pairwise uh, dye injection uh, in, in different brain areas and just looking at uh, the, the presence of double stain cells um, in galanin expressing cells, um, uh, Johnny was able to demonstrate that these galanin neurons do not bifurcate. So we uh, rarely, if ever, identify neurons that were labeled by two different dyes when the dyes were injected in different brain areas. And so this is very interesting as it suggests that um, different uh, galanin neurons form subpopulation or pools that each project to a particular brain areas. Uh, and therefore, we decided to focus our uh, next step of studies in four different brain areas that we thought could represent different aspects of parentic behavior. The periodical gray for its control in, uh, um, in, the, in the motor control of many social behaviors, the VTA involving motivation, uh, the medial amygdala for its role in social behavior, and the PVN for its role in uh, neuroendocrine regulation. And what we found using uh, rabies tracing is that from neurons expressing oxytocin, AVP, or CRH, so different uh, neuropeptide, that indeed the uh, MPOA galanin neuron send projection to all this population. And so we think that this particular pool of galanin neurons is involved in the neuromodulation of parenting. Uh, we then looked and uh, manipulated the projection of galanin neurons to the periodical gray. And so we implanted an optic probe on the top of the um, periodical gray and looked at the influence of either activation or inhibition of uh, this particular projection site when an animal was interacting with pups. And what we found is that when we activate this projection, we see an increase in the motor ex execution of parenting, suggesting that this particular pool of uh, galanin neurons is involved uh, in the motor execution of parenting. Then we looked and manipulated the projection to the VTA. And so we looked at males and females and, and activate or suppress the VTA uh, projection um, uh, from the galanin neurons, and we didn't see anything. We see absolutely no effect. And so we thought about it and then uh, re reminded ourselves to how much um, a lens an animal, a mother in particular, will go through in order to identify and, and retrieve her pups. So here is a female, uh, and her pups are in this uh, deep cup here, and she realized that and you know, wants to reach them, so is trying to uh, go through um, uh, the glass and you know, can't reach them, so she will see that, oh, there is an opening there, so she will try to reach them that way, but it's pretty tall, so not very easy. But finally, she found a way and successfully retrieved them. 
so as you can see, she, the, this uh, female is really uh, trying to go through a lot of obstacles to retrieve her pups. And so this inspired um, the, uh, this particular behavioral essay where we put some obstacle in between the female and the pups. And um, indeed, when we uh, stimulate uh, this uh, VTA projection, we found an increase in the probability of, of the females as well as the males to uh, reach over and, and um, gain access to the pups. Now, this experiment actually uh, is really interesting because when you do the experiment in a female, you increase the motivation of the female to reach the pups. And then when she's together with the pups, she starts to groom them and, and take care of them. But if you do the experiment on a virgin male, it also works, which is that the virgin male will also have a higher probability to reach over the obstacle. But once it reaches the pups, it kills them. Because what we do here is just very specifically stimulate the projection to the VTA. We're not stimulating the projection to the preacutical gray, which is the area that is necessary for the display of parenting. So these animals are still infanticidal, but that particular projection is involved to the uh, motivation to reach the pups. So I think qu quite an interesting uh, observation. And then finally, when we manipulate the projection to the medial amygdala, we found that uh, we reduce social interaction between adults. So overall, these really uh, provide an interesting deconstruction of the circuit uh, driving parenting in which we have these different pool of gallant neurons that each receive uh, a variety of input that signal uh, pub stimuli, the external state or uh, external uh, environment. And in turn, these neurons form population that reach only one target and one play one particular uh, role. For example, the motor control by uh, uh, the projection to the PAG or motivation through the VTA, social interaction through the medial amygdala, and uh, various neuroendocrine control through the PVN. And this really reminded us very much of uh, an organization that was described before by Tom Jessel and Sylvia Arbor of um, the organization of uh, the motor pool in, in, the, control, in the spinal cord um, by, uh, by, by different pool of neurons, which we think might be also uh, a motif that is conserved for the organization of social behaviors. And obviously, it will be important to see whether other social behavior obey this role. Um, so these uh, lead us to um, then look at uh, another uh, set of behavior, which is uh, infanticidal behavior. One role of the galanin neurons is to inhibit the display of parenting behavior in fathers um, and, um, uh, and in other animals. So what, what is the target of, uh, uh, of, of this particular branch of the circuit? What is the control node of infanticidal behavior? And here, Anita Autry uh, performed a very similar experiment as uh, Herbert did uh, previously and identify a particular set of neurons in an area that had never heard before called the periphonical area. And using laser capture microscopy after we were despaired uh, to find candidate genes, she was able to identify another peptide, uh, urocortin-3, as uh, nicely overlapping uh, with the CFOS expressing cells in the periphonical area. Now, urocortin-3 is an interesting peptide because uh, it's a ligand of CRF2, um, and it's part of the stress response pathway. And so, as I mentioned to you, stress is intimately linked to uh, infant neglect and aggression, suggesting that indeed this could be uh, exactly the node for infanticidal behavior that we were looking for. So one interesting question, obviously, is whether these neurons are activated by any form of aggression or they're just very specifically for uh, this uh, particular aggression towards infant. In other words, is there a generic aggressive circuit or is there a very specific set of circuit in the brain that mediate this particular uh, form of aggression towards infant? And what we found is that uh, when we tested animals for male-male aggression, maternal aggression, any type of other forms of aggression, we found CFOS positive cells, but they never overlapped with urocortin-3. In other words, it seems to be the case um, that there might be a particular system that uh, has uh, evolved to drive this uh, form of aggression towards infant. 
So indeed, when we looked at the input uh, of these uh, urocortin cells, uh, we found quite a number of interesting areas, in particular uh, the PVN, uh, the medial preoptic area, the medial amygdala, so all part of the pathway uh, that are expected. And interestingly, when we looked using again rabies viruses uh, from the uh, perifornical area um, and found the input and the nature of the input in the paravatricular nucleus, we found that uh, vasopressin cells as well as CRH cells were highly marked. And similarly, when we tried to identify the input from the preoptic area, we found that uh, these cells were galanin positive. Now, this is really interesting because galanin cells, remember, are GABAergic. In other words, when the animal are parenting, these cells are firing and might indeed inhibit uh, the function of this uh, periphonical area that are activated during infanticidal. Behavior. So the input pap uh, revealed this link to both the vomonasal pathway and neurons involved in social control, stress, and parenting. So what are these neurons doing? Well, when we silence them in males, we found that these animals are no longer infanticidal and um, uh, um, and and. Um, take much longer to attack infant if they ever attack them. Interestingly, in contrast to the stimulation of galaninion, the silencing of galaninions, we found that these have long-term effect, which is that when we silence these cells, the animal become parental and stay parental, uh, which is something we never observed for the stimulation of galaninions. So we think these neurons are required for the control of male infanticide. Now we stimulate them in females either chemogen chemogenetically using dreads or optogenetically and what we found is uh, the emergence of interesting aggressive displays. So he is a mother and a pup here and you'll see a little uh, bright dot here when we uh, just trigger the, uh, the activity of these cells and uh, what you'll see during the stimulation which is now, suddenly this tail rattling, which is uh, very typical of aggressive display, and then uh, the females start to roughen the, the pup a little bit. So um, again, it seems like the activation of these cells elicit uh, aggressive display and impairs maternal behavior. So as we did with uh, parenting, now we want to dissect how this works. And, um, uh, we found among the projection areas uh, some really uh, interesting areas. So these are uh, the, uh, the map of uh, projections. And um, the three that we studied in particular were first the VMH, the ventral medial hypothalamus. This is David Anderson's favorite brain area where he and Dayulin really established the central role of, uh, of, of this locus to drive aggressive behavior. And we thought, you know, this has to be it. The stimulation of the periphonical area leads to VMH activation and that drives aggression. We had it all uh, figured out. Um, it turns out that uh, it didn't work that way. As you can see here, uh, when we uh, stimulate uh, optogenetically, the terminals of the urocortin cells to the VMH, uh, the female here approaches the pup and sort of hover around the pup and then return to the nest and then come back and then hover again. So seem to be uh, reluctant to engage in, in nurturing the pup. Uh, but we never saw any aggression. And I kept telling my postdoc, you know, you have to do it again. You know, VMH has to drive aggression. She spent an entire, she wasted an entire year thanks to me, uh, trying to find aggression. We never found any aggression. Okay, so then we turn. Um, <laughs> so we think that this projection drives neglect instead of aggression. So then we turn to what we thought would be the second best candidate, the lateral septum, uh, which is involving anxiety and therefore might drive uh, aggression. So we stimulated um, here in this video, you'll see the female will approach the pup, and when she approached the pup, we trigger the light and pay attention because the behavior is extremely fast. Here. And then we stimulate the lateral septum projection here. Oops. The female immediately uh, uh, flees the, pr the presence of pup, goes to the nest, and never reapproaches the pup. So again, no aggression whatsoever, uh, but uh, very clear and, and sustained uh, pup avoidance. 
So finally, we looked at the area that is actually the major projection area of urocotin cells, but we had never heard of that brain area. It's called the amygdala hippocampal transition area. Never heard of it. If you do a search uh, in PubMed, there's nothing on this. It's like, you know, whatever, a new area. And this time, when we stimulate the projection to this brain area, we found extremely clear sign of aggression, uh, which is the animal, the, the female, grabbed the pup by the belly and carried it around and shaking it uh, exactly as a display of normal uh, classical infanticidal behavior. So here again, I think we reached some really interesting uh, deconstruction of this uh, infanticidal circuit, where um, these uh, different uh, projections areas, the VMH, the lateral septum, and the amygdalo hippocampal area, each drive a particular aspect of um, pub-mediated aggression slash neglect. Now, interestingly, um, it turns out that uh, in contrast to the galanin cells, these peripheral areas send multiple branches to multiple projection areas. So it's not as simple uh, as distinct pools, each doing something different. And we think that uh, the difference in the outcome of this brain area might also come from the fact that both these urocotin cells, as well as the projection areas, uh, get input from neurons uh, from the galanin cells involved in parenting behavior. So it's possible that uh, these, in part at least, uh, modulate some of the response of these uh, projection areas. So overall, we have this really interesting interconnected circuit between this uh, node controlling various aspects of parenting and node corresponding to various aspects of uh, neglect or um, uh, attack uh, towards infant. And, um, and these two are, are clearly uh, mutually exclusive. Now, interestingly, uh, these neurons are all in the preoptic area, and the preoptic area uh, is extremely functionally diverse, as I mentioned, involved in uh, many uh, different social behavior and um, also homeostatic function. And so that led us to try to uh, understand a little bit more the organization uh, of, of this um, uh, area. And uh, for these, we perform a single cell profiling of the preoptic area using two distinct strategies, single cell sequencing, so dissociating the cells from the preoptic area and identifying the um, different population, as well as uh, in a collaboration with Jiao Wei Zhuang, uh, MRFish, um, which is the, um, this multiplex in situ hybridization that enabled on a restricted number of genes to identify very precisely the gene profile of cells in situ in tissue, tissue section. And so, although so the single cell sequencing uh, gives this unbiased detection of genes, but also um, uh, is not specially resolved. Here we have a technique where we can very quickly scan millions of cells in a, a specially resolved way and also in an extremely sensitive uh, way. Um, so this uh, work uh, uh, led to um, the scanning uh, using MRFish of uh, the entire preoptic area uh, using uh, 155 genes that were partially identified using uh, the single cell sequencing. And so this uh, technology enabled to see in situ uh, various markers that each uh, characterizes uh, various cell types. And I think one of the extraordinary advantage of the Murphish approach also is uh, the extraordinary sensitivity of the approach, which is that genes that are typically not detectable by in situ herbalization, such as neuropeptide receptors, oxytocin receptors, are very clearly identified uh, using Murphish. And so this really provides this mapping of all the cell types in the preoptic area. These are just the very uh, large cell types, the, the big category of cell types. But uh, for us, obviously, what is interesting is to try to see now to relate this work uh, with um, the cell population we know that are involved in social behavior. And in particular, what about Ghanaian cells? Well, to our surprise, we actually identified 
11 subtypes of galanin cells, which each a distinct molecular and spatial profile. So here is uh, I7, so this is a cluster that has a very uh, particular uh, gene profile, and as you can see, a very uh, particular uh, spatial expression. Uh, this is I11, I14, etc., etc. So all these 11 types uh, can be now mapped very precisely um, and, uh, on, on the preoptic area. Um, and even more interestingly, we can also identify their function by looking at CFOS expression when the animal has undergone um, a particular behavior. So here's a typical uh, Murphish image with all the RNA and now CFOS that tell us, reveal to us, which of these populations are actually um, involved in a particular behavior, for example, parenting behavior. And so uh, this led us to identify uh, a, a number of populations involved in parenting in ways that are, I think, extraordinarily interesting. Uh, first, we found six populations of cells involved in parenting. One of them, express galanin, that's the cluster I14. This is, we think, the uh, initial population that Herbert had identified, is 40% of cells that are galanin positive and CFOS positive. These are uh, cells of this I14 cluster here. Um, they are activated in mothers, in fathers, and in virgin females. So all animals that are parental um, activate this particular cell type. <coughs> But interestingly, there are additional cell types that are not galanin positive, but that are found activated only in mothers or only in fathers, or both in mother and in father. So we now have a more sophisticated view of all the cell populations that are involved in parenting. And we also found two populations that are involved in uh, uh, infant-mediated aggression in virgin males, with one of them, um, this cluster E28 uh, corresponding to uh, this urocotin cell that we had identified before. So, um, so we now have not only one population, but actually six populations of preoptic area neurons involved in parenting in both males and female. And um, uh, the, uh, this core uh, MPOE galanin cells now are uh, narrowed down uh, with very high specificity to this one cluster I14, and then mother and father recruit other population. So um, I think what we have now is really an extraordinary tool um, that identify cells that are behaviorally relevant with extraordinary high granularity and cellular resolution. And that really, I think, will transform the way we now will uh, look at behavior. And I would like to uh, give you two examples of this. This is work in progress, but I think uh, at least um, I, I found uh, quite uh, interesting. So one is that now we are imaging um, using microendoscopy to look at animal engaged in parenting parenting behavior and try to identify the function of the various population that we have identified uh, molecularly. Now, this is not a molecular identification. All the neurons express GCAM, but um, when we have uh, this uh, female here interacting uh, with pups, so in a minute or in a few seconds, you see here is the pup, and as soon as the mother starts to interact with the pups, we can see um, uh, calcium transient in specific uh, population of neurons. And interestingly, when we look at the, uh, the number and the type of population and their association with behavior, we found that there are indeed, indeed many uh, neuronal population that associate with different aspects of parenting. So we found, for example, that one cluster is very tightly linked to nest building, another one to the retrieval of pups, and another one to pup grooming. And so now we are trying to uh, link this uh, particular population to their molecular makeup. Uh, so I think this is really uh, enlarging our view uh, of, to the control of parenting uh, in animals with different physiological status. But to go back to this galanin population, which we now can narrow down to this very particular cluster called I14, these are these I14 cells in this area called the striohypocampal area, um, and then here the, um, the, the MPN. First, um, now, uh, 
all of these cells, over 90% of these I14 cells are activated during parenting. So this is really our parenting uh, neurons uh, very clearly. And now we can uh, perform molecular studies and try to see how gene expression changes in these cells or their morphology or their synaptic activity or their synaptic contact between animals that have a different parenting display. So just as a teaser, uh, here is some really interesting gene expression difference between mother and virgin males, and one gene particularly interesting is the progesterone receptor. This is interesting because it was reported uh, many years ago that uh, the progesterone receptor mutant uh, males are unable to become paternal. And so we found that indeed these genes is highly expressed in virgin males but no longer expressed in mothers. Another really interesting gene is uh, one of uh, David Anderson's favorite gene, TAC2, which is involved in aggressive behavior. And so, uh, in addition, we also we know that there are profound changes in activity in uh, galanin cells between parenting and non-parenting animals. And indeed, we found uh, uh, profound changes in the expression of certain ion channel. So um, I think, just uh, to summarize, um, I think at this point, we've been able to uh, provide uh, some circuit deconstruction of infant-mediated behavior. We found um, uh, this uh, circuit that relies on specific sensory cues which we were able to identify and that have this very interesting logic of organization um, uh, which uh, enable uh, the uh, display of very specific components of parental behavior, but also that enable them to be modulated by the animal physiological state, such that uh, not only uh, the, these behaviors are sex specific, but they also vary according to the physiological state uh, of the animal. We also have now reached this ex exquisite uh, spatial, molecular, and functional resolution of cells involved in behavior control, and these give us access both to molecular tools as well as physiological tools to understand how behavior is controlled, and we hope that this will lead us to a better understanding of the control of this behavior, maybe in other species, and also when things get wrong in uh, uh, diseases. And on this, I want to thank the people who uh, performed the work. Uh, the work on parenting was initiated by Herbert, who um, I mentioned several times, is now in Richard's lab. Uh, Johnny Cole, Anita Autry worked on parenting and infanticide circuit. The microendoscopy was performed by Ying Li, and now Mustafizu Raman and Kelsey Klausing. Single cell analysis was done in collaboration with Jiao Wei Zhang, uh, by DJ Bamba Muku and Eric Vo, and now by two uh, new members of the lab. And uh, I'm very grateful to all my collaborators, Venki Murthy and his member of his lab, Alexander Mattis and Vic Kapoor, Mark Schnitzer and uh, Benny Groove, Li Chun Lu and Naoshida and uh, Benedict Babayan in his lab, and then finally people in uh, Jiawei Zhuang's lab. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Catherine, for a wonderful talk. So um, we have time for some questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And then there are people with mics at the edges, and the mic will come to you wherever you are. So there's no central aisle. But uh, we'll wait here until there are questions. So. Oh, we have a question here. We'll get one of those balls. Thank you. Always amazing work. After three, three weeks of a bred male, will he then retrieve the hybrid plus pheromone block, or are more cues needed for retrieval compared to attack? Sorry, I, I didn't understand the beginning of your question. Start again. But after three weeks, yeah. will a bred male who formerly was attacking the hybrid block, will he then retrieve the hybrid block plus pheromone, or are more cues needed for a retrieval versus the attack? You know, we, we've not done the experiment on uh, animal after mating. Um, so we've done only on virgin males, so animals that will attack. And by the way, uh, animals that are parenting, maybe that answers partially your question, whether females or fathers don't care about these dummies. In other words, those dummies do not elicit parenting behavior. It's very clear. That was very nice. 
Uh, do you find any evidence for homosexual behavior? Yes. Turks no. too, mouse. <laughs> the mice we have, the mutants we have, are, I would say, bisexual. They would mate indiscriminately with males. So it's going in that direction. So yeah. principally, it could be possible, yeah. But there's It'd no be interesting to see whether by behavioral manipulations alone, not genetic manipulations, you could move somebody from being primarily interested in one sex to being interested in another. No, so we don't see this. But what we see, however, is another part of the equation, which is the sexual identity of the animal. Um, and this is, I think, extraordinarily interesting because we have no idea what provide you know, the identity of, of oneself as a male or a female. And uh, what we found is that in the mutant, uh, it's something in between, which is the animal now also behaves like a male. And so um, this might have uh, an impact, maybe not on the understanding of homosexuality, but maybe transsexuality. And in fact, um, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Ben Barras and, and other people were really interested in, in this data uh, because of this, of this reason. So you've beautifully shown us selection between behaviors, but in a sense it, it's almost binary. There is aggression or there isn't aggression. There's maternal behavior or there isn't, and so on. How many neurons are involved in the circuits that you show us that actually determine these behaviors? Obviously, clearly the motor output is going to regard, re require large numbers of neurons, but the choices themselves could almost be made by single neurons as you diagrammed it. And so the question is, how many neurons are involved in each of these layers to make the behavioral choice? I would say, pro well, we don't know for sure, but I would say several hundred in, in probably several hundred. But I, I'm not sure it's entirely binary because there's neglect also. And that's also part of the, the negative reaction towards infants. I'm over here, hi. Um, so I'm a psychotherapist and a parenting coach, so all of your research is really interesting to me in terms of how that translates to humans. And earlier when um, there was that little video of the mother kind of hovering over the pups, um, it got me thinking about helicopter parenting, which we talk about so much nowadays, kind of hovering over, over children. And I was wondering if you've noticed any, whatever we would define to be helicopter parenting with mice, if you've, seen, if you've seen that kind of behavior in your research? Well, so I actually have a different interpretation of that result. I think what's happening is that the female is trying to reach the pup, wants to be parental. And when we stimulate neurons that drive neglect, then she, you know, she avoids them and then come back and then avoid them. And so it's like a conflict, right, before, uh, between the drive to be parenting and the stimulation of that particular population that tells her not to be parenting. So I would not say, I don't think it's helicopter parents, but maybe, maybe a woman with postpartum depression who tries and can't do it and, and comes back and forth and, and have difficulty of taking care of a child. One last comment. Uh, do you have any insight into what's happening in the female brains when they're undergoing infanticide for their first litters, for example? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the, when females have their first litter, they are very stressed. And we think that this is the component that tilt the balance activate uh, these uh, urocortin cells. In fact, we've done the experiment uh, when we uh, stress females um, uh, chronically, we see high activation of these urocortin cells and as a result, a reduction in parenting behavior. So we think that uh, this is where stress acts. And in fact, because these cells receive this massive input from CRH neurons that are involved in, in the neuroendocrine aspect of, of stress, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you again. So now before you all go, first of all, I would like to thank the team that has been putting this together, all our staff, uh, the people in the advisory uh, committee that included students, postdocs, faculty, staff members, and I'd like to invite 
Kelly Rimol, our Director of Programs, to come up and explain a bit the organization of the symposium and what we need to do next. So thank you for everyone that helped make this possible, and thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Rui, and thank you for all of you, uh, to all of you for your attention here. Um, we're doing great things, and we're so happy that you're meeting us here. We'd like you to, to continue the conversation online on Twitter at the hashtag Zuckerman Symposium. Also, as you can see in your program, we have a poster session across the street. As you exit the auditorium, you'll go down the stairs or down the elevator across one block um, and join us on the ninth floor. And at 8 o'clock, if you're willing to stick around, uh, we're showing you how we do things differently here with a live storytelling event, uh, also in the same building, the Jerome L. Green Science Center on the uh, ground floor at Dear Mama. Tomorrow, please join us at 9 a.m. for David Anderson's talk. Keep your badge, keep your materials, uh, and come early as we're expecting another full house. Thank you.